stopped playing. A point in his life came when he stopped. He just stopped. It really, at the height of his career. And a friend of mine, Lenny Silverberg, saw him on the street one day. He didn't know him. And stopped him and said, uh, Thelonious, how come you're not playing anymore? And he said, the piano, Monk said, the piano is a young man's art. And then he said, you're red-haired. Is it also red on your chest? Can I see it? And Lenny opened his shirt to show him it really was. <laughs> Cherish. This is uh, a poem I think I read last time. Um, Those of you who are involved or have been involved in universities might not be true of CSULB. CSULB is uh, charmed to be outside the academic, at least in terms of its poetry, the academic world, the world of uh, critical theory, the world of deconstruction, the world with every, where every fourth word starts with meta. <laughs> and I, I was reading through a list of magazines and where to publish, and this particular magazine said, quote, we are not interested in the poetry of nostalgia. And I knew what that meant. Uh, you know, it meant they didn't want anything that was coherent, let alone about someone's <laughs> real life. <laughs> and, you know, Long Beach in L.A., I was talking to Donna about this earlier, just for a minute or two, Long Beach in L.A. are different in terms of the poetry sensibility from anywhere else in the United States, and have been for 40 years. Um, I don't know if the good angel of that was Bukowski, and he was part of it. Uh, but Long Beach in L.A. developed a kind of poetry, and I'm sure many of you know this, that is not being written anywhere else in the United States. A poetry that is demotic, that is also demonic at times, <laughs> but certainly <laughs> demotic, uh, and accessible. <clears throat> and um, that's not going on as the mainstream of the poetic tradition in any other cities that I know of in the United States. Certainly not in, in, in San Francisco. Maybe to some extent in San Diego, but not in the universities. Cherish. So this is just, to some extent, make a lot of fun of all that stupa, stupid, highfalutin, polysyllabic gibberish that passes for hyper-sophisticated intellectual discourse. Mm -hmm. But it's also, of course, about that other world, the real world, hopefully. Hopefully. Cherish. Yes. Can I still be heard back there? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just turn this. Oops. Sorry about that. My apologies. I want to turn this around so I can kind of lean on this. Yes, of course. The sign and the thing in itself are in no manner the same. It goes without saying. We all understand the grammatological nature of metaphonemic and proto-factual discourse. What Trubetskoy would surely have called the contingent glossomatics of the indeterminate text. <laughs> But the trouble is, notwithstanding all that, the past won't shut up, won't leave me in peace. I want it all back. Not the nomenclature of epistemic linguistics or some sort of post-dialectic mode of discursive assertion. <laughs> but rather, my folks in that cozy doorway in Flatbush, that house on 14th Street, Carol's old piano, Mickey's black wooden attorney at law sign hung from the window over that shingle hatch to the basement, and that little storefront on 10th where I hawked circle line tours of Manhattan. My booth at the magic carpet, 
just off the boardwalk in Coney Island, three blocks from Nathan's, the North Atlantic, pounding away at my back. That movie house in Miami where the black patrons had to sit in the balcony. I could hardly fucking believe it and work there with a bad conscience for two months. Would they have me abandon the past, devote what time I have left to the unstable nature of syntax, to manipulating self-referential lexical signs? <laughs> I, the most shameless and least enigmatic of singers? I, who wish no more than to remember and cherish I, who now to my own grief well understand in the words of Nicanor Parra that the decades have wings. Despite the indeterminate, self-defeating problematics of verbal representation, I insist that furnished place up on 92nd off Amsterdam Avenue really exists, or it did. And those evenings spent haunting the failure, those ancient grainy Chaplin and Marx Brothers slapsticks, and that woman I brought home one night from the Cedar Bar where Franz Klein used to hold court. Not a structural coefficient of syntactic presence, but an actual woman. <laughs> <laughs> George, George Antile's old flame. And the evening I spent there with Duncan and the week Jim Fraser came back from his pilgrimage to the Scottish Highlands sporting kilts and he and I took that place together off Avenue B where Carol Berger lived with Peter and Sandra Scapatone had a place just down the hall. Suzuki Bean already a raging success and a flight above me Bill Merwin and Moira. One morning trembling I sat on a bench in Tompkins Square Park, ingesting that first City Lights edition of Howl, that ferocious tidal American rant like those earlier days when I'd ride the Brighton Express reading Whitman and weeping. It was Ginsburg himself one night, after a reading at St. Mark's, a good decade later, who introduced me to Potter whom he knew I adored. And I stood there, stupidly shaking his hand with nothing to say, to hell with the signifier's oblique figurations, the nomos of indeterminate linguistic praxis. It's those mornings waking with Rosy, my first love, back there on 6th Street, the past, even now, inexpressibly present. The evening that Jane and Wendy dragged me to Gertie's Folk City to watch some kid named Dylan wailing over the mic, Diane, this time around, I'll let you do that strip tease at the party. Why the hell not? <laughs> then we'll head back to my place. No, this time I'm not going to stop you. Nor do I mean to ever forget your sister dying like that so suddenly, so young. Cassidy, too, gone now forever. And Joan, and Linda, and Jeremy, John, Dennis, and Greg, Larry, and Doug, and that large, loving, boisterous tribe of aunts and uncles and cousins, Sally and Gertie and Manus and Mark and George and Terry and Molly and Willie and Nat. I want to be there again. Those teeming streets of downtown Manhattan, those Lower East Side cafes, all those poets and dopers and crazies back in the 60s, the friends that I'll never now get to cherish enough. Alan Cohn and Faye Goldman 
and lovely, voluptuous Billy Grayson out on the Tilden clay courts. Is Eddie DeMarco alive? Is Vinny, Lou Lipton, Marilyn Branscom, cherish, cherish. That's all I can tell you. Sign and signifier be damned. No one and nothing down here is going to last. You know it too. Nikanor Potter.